Good morning, Covenant Life, and welcome to Fellowship Fortnite. We've been together for so many weeks on Zoom, and it's been good. I especially loved hearing people worship, and of course, we've gone through a sermon series as well, uh, looking through the Gospel of John, chapter 14 specifically, and we've had a wonderful time in God's Word as well. I'm so grateful to each and every one of you for being faithful in attendance and faithful in your giving. All that is wonderful and great, and I'm so glad that we have that. But you know what? We did miss each other, didn't we? We did miss fellowship, hugs, the warmth of uh, each other's conversations and tones, and uh, lunch, of course, food uh, that we can uh, fellowship together. All that is also important. And now as things lift, as things normalize, get back to normal, uh, we don't want to make corona anything that could stop us. We don't, want to, we don't want it to be a hurdle. We don't want it to be an excuse to stop us to get in fellowship and get back with each other. I am praying that uh, things will open up soon and we'll be able to meet together at Constantia Hall. But, you know, the Lord has been uh, laying on my heart the need for, to, to connect us all together. So as we get together in groups, you might even say, wow, we love this. We don't even want to come all the way to Constantia Hall. Can we do this here, Pastor? We'll watch you online and you come visit us some other time. I would love that idea. I'm glad you thought of it. But as we do that and we get together, I hope that this morning is a very precious morning of conversations. And the fewer we are, the deeper we get, right? So we can get into conversations, talk about how each, each other is doing, uh, really get into each other's lives, show that we care, show that we love one another in our care. So this morning, let me get us started with a word of prayer, after which I want to st uh, straight away get into God's word, share with you a few thoughts on fellowship, of course. Jonathan's going to lead us in a bit of worship. You can have then some open worship as well, uh, following that. And you just have to pause the video. I'll let you know when to do that. And then, of course, we'll share communion together. So I do hope that you have your communion uh, ready. I do hope that lunch is on the stove and soon we'll be able to uh, connect with each other uh, over lunch. Father in heaven, thank you so much, Lord, for each and every member of our family here at Covenant Life. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to gather here in this wonderful way in homes across the NCR. Father, we pray for authenticity. We pray, O oh God, that we would be truly committed to the ones who are in front of us, to the ones that God has put in front of us, to the family that God has placed us in. Father God, we, uh, we want to show, we want to express your love to God's family first. And as we look into your word right now, make that clear to us, Lord. Show us what's on your heart with regard to the church. We come from so many different backgrounds and we have our own definitions of what church is all about, but we want to know what your definition is. What did Jesus have in mind when he gathered his people together? What did he have in mind when he wanted to prepare a bride for himself? What did God have in mind when he sent Jesus out to bring back the lost and the fatherless? So Father, we want to go back to biblical definitions and we want to be that. We want to be that church here in the city. And Father, we're willing to make any adjustments and changes at any cost to us, Lord, so that we may look and feel like an authentic church. Thank you, Lord, for your presence here today in this home, in this place, in this venue. So be here, Lord. Be present. Be present to serve. Be present to heal. Be present to speak to lift us up, to unite us, for therein lies the beauty of our, uh, of our faith, of our walk with you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this morning. Open our eyes that we may see things in your word that are wonderful, that are life-changing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's get straight into God's word. If you have your Bibles and if you have some notes uh, or something to take notes in, that would be really great. Uh, we are gathered together here because I really want us to have fellowship this morning. So I'm going to try and keep my message short, but I don't promise. And I do want you to spend more time in fellowship. Fellowship means prayer, praying for one another with each other. Fellowship means really caring for the body of Christ as if they were family. 
uh, because we are blood relatives, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're gathered together because we're geographically close, which means we could be available to each other even at other times. It's not about only the ceremony of our Christian faith, but it's also the caring that we want to focus on. So we are here together because you guys are close to each other, because you're within a, 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 a driving range. Uh, and I've kind of worked that out to, uh, for you so that you will know who all are nearby and you'll be able to connect with each other, even in other places. You want to go out to coffee, go shopping, uh, get together and serve somebody else who's in need. You know, be the body. Be the body of Christ. I'm looking forward to some good fellowship, uh, some worship with Jonathan as well as he leads us in a few songs. And some of you just open up and pray and worship together. That's going to be beautiful. But as we think about this, I want to share with you the five A's of spiritual family. The five A's of being a spiritual family. It's very important that we understand this and that we be this. Because we come from... Um, uh, what we call traditions, we come from backgrounds, we have been uh, taught certain ways to express our faith, we've been taught certain ways to live out our faith, and none of those are wrong per se, but when we stay close to the Bible and we understand the first century church, we get the purest form, we get the cleanest form of how the church understood what the church was about to be, how the people understood Paul and, and, and Peter and the other guys and what they were telling them the church should be. So one of the most uh, sought after passages, one of the passages that define the church is Acts chapter 2 verse 42 through to 47. You're very familiar with this passage, at least you should be. And I want to go over that passage real quick. And I want to give you five A's, five A's of a spiritual family. So let me read that passage for you and then we'll get back to the five A's. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through to 45, uh, 47, 42 to 47. And they devoted themselves, that's all the believers who had become believers in Jerusalem, uh, as uh, in a miraculous event had happened, we call it the Pentecost, the Holy Spirit had arrived on the 120 disciples that were waiting in the upper room as Jesus had told them to wait. And the church was now founded. It was absolutely exploding. People were coming to the Lord every day. Verse 41 said, So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. We're talking explosion. And as they gathered, they didn't look for a building. They didn't look for one place that they should all come together. This is how the early church thought themselves to function. Verse 42, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. Imagine that. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the Apostles, not the 120, not everybody else, not the 3000, through the apostles. And all who believed were together, geographic, and had all things in common, economic. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. They didn't just sell everything and sit there. When there was a need, that's when they sold it. And day by day, day by day, attending the temple together. So they did go to the temple, but why? And breaking bread in their homes. They gathered in homes, but why? And they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I have exposited this passage over and over again. You can find my messages on, on uh, the YouTube channel or on the website, on my app. Uh, I, can, I will be teaching it again and again in the future for sure. And you could study it on your own as well. But here we are. The five A's of spiritual family. Go over that passage again. Be sure to know that passage of scripture as being our definition, our biblical definition of fellowship. And here we are. We're talking fellowship because it's fellowship fortnight. We want to focus on one or perhaps two Sundays of meeting in homes like this and perhaps... Uh, continuing this tradition if, uh, if we can uh, manage both Sunday morning as well as uh, during the week. So that of course is up to you. Are you ready to write? 
Are you ready to write? Hey, hang on, hang on. Um, they gathered together and they uh, prayed together. They gathered together, they studied God's word together. We'll look into that for just a minute. But you know what? Why don't you pause me right now? Pause the video and just ask around the group. Is there any needs that we could pray for? Would you do that? Pause the video and just uh, maybe the leader or one of you could take the up, take the initiative to ask around the room. Is there any needs? Anybody really struggling with any needs? If you're a larger group, then break into about twos or threes and just would you pray for each other right now? Pray for those specific needs and ask God, Lord, would you provide that need? I know you know how to pray. Take take a moment right now. Pause and get back to me. Welcome back. Here are the five A's of uh, a spiritual family. Number one, adoration. Adoration. Adoration is the praise that one offers and the prayers that one offers in worship. Adoration. Uh, they devoted themselves to, to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayers. Now, he says the prayers and there's very specific four theologies there. But when you drop down a little further and you're talking about how they spent time together and what they did. He says they all believed uh, and all who were together, um, they believed together, they strengthened one another's faith and they were selling their possessions, etc, uh, etc. Et and verse 46, he says, day by day attending the temple courts, they were doing that together on Sundays, they would meet on Solomon's portico and then breaking bread in homes, that's eating food together. That means they had meals together and they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. This praise, this adoration is the constant thanks for who God has made us, what God has given to us, the gratefulness of our hearts for the way God has uh, provided for us. When we do that together, there is power in that. When we are generous to each other and when we are grateful together, there is power uh, in that. The first A of a spiritual family is the family is, uh, it praises God together. It's easy to pray to God for things, but when God answers prayer, to praise God together. To say, thank you, Lord, for answering that prayer. Thank you, Lord, for providing for that. There's a constant spirit of thank you, Lord. Uh, there's a constant spirit of counting the blessings naming them by uh, item. Uh, we're constantly saying, Lord, we're grateful for this. Lord, we're grateful for that. Looking on the, not just looking on the bright side, but uh, seeing the way, seeing the positive way in which God has provided. Yes, there are things that happen in our life that are difficult. And uh, I'm not saying to ignore them or, or sweep them away, but also keep on talking about the good things that are happening in our life. Isn't it amazing that God provided that? Isn't it wonderful that that person showed up? Isn't that fantastic for the way those two people met and that? Isn't, be isn't it beautiful the way the Lord has healed or the Lord has touched or the Lord has provided? We are constantly counting and looking and discerning and identifying how God is active in our lives. It is very important that we keep up a spirit of adoration, a spirit of, of thing. That's a, that's a family. A spiritual family. A spiritual family is always looking for a good reason to praise and uh, adore God. So praise and prayer. Note the word awe. These four things they did in verse 42, but the verse 43 begins with an awe came upon every soul. You can't adore unless there is awe. You can't adore unless the person in your eyes is awesome. And as you think about and look at God and what his work is in our life, you will be filled. As you see God's truth unfold, as you feel the presence of God in the uh, company of his saints, you will be filled with awe. Adoration, number one. Number two, the apostles' teaching. The apostles' teaching. Now, we're not talking about the Old Testament because that's the prophets' teaching. Those were the prophets' teaching. Moses and, uh, and Joshua and all of these guys, right? Isaiah and all of them. But then when you move to the New Testament, now we're talking about the birth of the church, the work of the church, the formation of the church, and the future of the church. So they were dedicated to the apostles' teaching. Now what does that mean? When you study the apostles' teaching, the apostles are the sent ones. They're the ones sent to form the church, to bring people into the church, to strengthen them. And they were, they were consolidating the church in the first century. 
Now, when you study the apostles, you're studying the character of the church, the purpose of the church, the health of the church, the success of the church, the growth of the church, the future of the church, the end of the church, right? By the end, I mean what's going to happen finally in the end. So we become students of who we are, why we're here, who we are to each other, what we need to do together, and what's coming up. That is what it means to study the apostles, to study the apostles' teaching. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the Gospels. Then you got Acts, which is actually Luke part two, where Luke begins to talk about the birth of the church, and this is how it happened. After Luke, you have Romans, which is a complete account of the doctrine of salvation, of the, do the gospel of salvation. And then from there on, you have letter after letter after letter sent out to all the churches. This is who you are. This is what you should be like. This is where you should meet. This is how you should behave. This is what you can trust God for, etc., etc. So the apostles' teaching. Why do we study the New Testament so much? Because that's who we are. Why do we study the Old Testament? Because that's who God is. You really get a good picture of who God is in the Old Testament. You really get a picture of who his people are in the New Testament. So that's adoration. Number one, the first A. Number two is apostles teaching. Uh, we are grounded in the word. And that's why Sunday after Sunday, I teach you the word. I teach you verse by verse. I teach you word by word. We're grounded in the word. We're firm on our convictions. We're firm on our convictions. And we are able to recognize heresies. So a spiritual family is Dev devoted, dedicated to the apostles' teaching, loves the word of God. And I know you do. I know you do. Loves the word of God, firm in convictions, and also recognizing when something wrong comes along, heresies, um, wrong teachings. Number three, authenticity. Authenticity. The third A in a spiritual family is authenticity. How do you feel about this? Isn't this one of the biggest problems in the church today? We say, oh, the biggest problem in the church today is hypocrisy. And we are not able to point to anyone who's authentic. Are there no examples of authenticity? So what does it look like when a church is authentic, when a family is authentic? It was about, it's about being real with one another. It's about being real with one another. It's about being, uh, being willing to open our lives up to one another. Is that us? Are we people who can look into each other's eyes and say, this is who I am. This is what I struggle with. This is how uh, I'm fighting my battles. Uh, would you pray for me? Would you strengthen me? Would you remember me? Would you help me? Would you lead me? Would you guide me? Would you mentor me? Would you encourage me? Are we willing to reach out to each other for help, for strength, for fellowship, for wisdom, for understanding? Or is everybody a hypocrite and you really don't have anybody to turn to? I think we have some area for improvement here. I speak as a shepherd. I think there is much uh, to be done here in this area because I, speaking as a pastor and speaking from my, purely my point of view, and I'd love to be wrong about this, but I do feel that members of Covenant Life, we come to church for our own. We come to church on our own and we come to church for our own. We're not really coming to church for the others in the church. And can we change that? Can we change that? If I'm wrong about it, great. If you are coming for other people, great. But if we're going to be a community, a spiritual family, maybe this is one area we can think about changing, about becoming better. And that's why I've gathered you in groups this morning. That's why I'm hoping that you'll keep this up. Because you look at people, you don't have to be involved in everybody's lives. And the church is going to keep growing bigger. That's why I've gathered you together here today. Because I want you to look around and say, Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to connect with some of these characters. I'm going to get together with them. I'm, I'm going to ask them into my life. And the best way to get people into your life is get them to your table. Feed them a meal. Have them over. And some of you have been doing that. And you know, the, you know the power of that. You know how beautiful that is. You don't have to get to know everybody in the church. And we're going to grow. We're going to become a large church. And there are going to be many other large churches. And God is going to bless all his churches. Uh, all around the city, everywhere. So we can't get to know everybody, but God does want us, want us to be authentic with a few people. And the commitment is both ways, by the way. The commitment is both ways to be authentic. What does it mean to be authentic? It means no masks. It means taking the trouble and the initiative and the courage to get involved in somebody else's lives and have them be involved in ours. 
to open up a little bit more than we would like to. A little bit more than we would like to. Number one, ad adoration. Number two, apostles' teaching. Number three, authenticity. Number four, application. Application. This is the obedience word. Are we going to do something about it? Are we going to do something about it? What does this word of God say about God? What does the word of God say about sin? About, about, uh, about the Holy Spirit? What does the word of God say about uh, gender equality? What does it say about uh, marriage or sex? What does it say about finances? What does it say about living our lives, values, people? Um, what does it say about character and behavior? What is right and what is wrong? What is appropriate? What is inappropriate? What is godly and what is carnal? What does the word of God say? And what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? So uh, application is the execution of the commandments of God. Application is the obedience to the commands of God. Here's how it works. We study the word together. And every time a sermon ends and every time a Bible study ends, there needs to be an I will statement. I will do this or renew this or start this again or get back to this. I will. And when you make an I will statement, you may not even write it down, but you might um, uh, mentally just note it. When you end a Bible study, you make an I will statement. When you end a sermon, you make an I will statement. One sermon, two sermons, three sermons, four sermons. Now you've got all these I will statements. Sooner or later, you're going to start doing them. You get what I'm saying here? You get what I'm saying here? So you don't say, I'm not going to do that because... You know, I, 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 I'd land up not doing most of them. You mark them anyway. And sooner or later, you're going to be like, I need to obey this. I need to obey this. Number one. Number two, when you come back to the group, when you come back to your small group, when you come back to your fellowship group, you ask each other, hey, you made an I will statement. Or you said that you were going to do oh, this is what God called us to do last week. Have we done it? Have we done it? Oh, uh, you know. Uh, I got I got busy and you know this week was tough and I didn't get around to it. <laughs> okay, no problem. So what are we going to do about it? Next week are we going to do it? Yeah, okay. Come next week, are we going to do it? You have application, you have authenticity, you have uh, accountability in every area of your life. In every area of your life. It's just as much in the spiritual life. Authenticity, application, and accountability. Every area of your life, you have these things. And that is why you do well. That's why you do well in your career. That's why you do well in your study. Because you have application. Because you have accountability. That's why you do well in your spiritual life when you have accountability. When there is no accountability in your life, when there is no application in your life, I'm going to, I will, and you make a plan. When there is no plan to do what God has commanded you to do. You will not do it. When there is no accountability, whether you did it or not, you will not do it. You and I are not built, not wired, not designed that way. You and I need accountability. That's why you yell at your children. That's why you put reminders on your phone. That's why you set deadlines. That's why there are apps designed around that for those who manage their own lives. That's why some people do better in an in a, in a institutionalized job, in, a, in some sort of a format with some routine and some uh, you know, rules and regulations. Why people are more productive, more creative, more effective, more, more fruitful uh, in, in those networks. Some people say, oh, I, I like a structured Well, That's what you're asking for. You're asking for accountability. Very, very, very few of us fly solo. Most of us need each other. Number five, accountability. Accountability. This is not about being in an army and slapping each other on the wrist every time we fail. This is not about that. It's just about a simple way of turning to one another and says, Hey man, last week I decided to uh, do this. You decided to do that. How did we do? Did we, did we do okay? Um, uh, yeah, w w what's our excuse? Okay. This week, let's make it happen. And sooner or later, you're going to start seeing growth. Sooner or later, you're getting going to get down to it. You're going to make it a priority. Even if it just means you don't want to be embarrassed again. But accountability does work. Tell me, 
Why do you have accountability in your workplace? In your family home, one person always takes the responsibility or takes on the authority to, to hold everybody else accountable in the home. It happens. Why do you have accountability in the government? On the street, on the roads, but only in your spiritual life. Nobody's asking you any questions. Only with matters of spiritual accountability, with matters of spiritual relationships and spiritual disciplines. Nobody exists who asks you any questions. Isn't that dangerous? Isn't that, isn't that scary? How can the most important thing in your life be the most unexamined? We have to get back to basics. We have to ask ourselves the tough questions. Accountability isn't, we're not trying to make church the army. We're not trying to make God's people a place of, of you know, ridicule and shame and guilt. No, no. But when we work together and when we encourage one another, it will work. It does help. You can't make disciples without discipline. And fellowship is the climate where disciples are made. Fellowship is the climate where disciples are made. Why fellowship? Because love is the motivation behind discipleship. Love is the motivation behind discipleship. Okay, five A's of a spiritual family. Number one. That's right, adoration. Number two, yep, apostles' teaching. Number three, authenticity. Number four, application. And number five, accountability. Accountability. You're gathered together today because fellowship is the most important thing on the face of the earth. Where my people are gathered, I am present, God says. Fellowship has great advantages. The difference between socializing and fellowship is the presence of the Holy Spirit. The mark of the presence of the Holy Spirit is that you talk to Him or you talk through Him and that's prayer. So the difference between two friends getting together and two believers getting together is prayer. So if the Word of God is our food, then fellowship is the exercise. If the Word of God is food, then fellowship is exercise. And what do you say to me always? If you're going to eat, you should also exercise right so if you eat and you don't exercise you get fat I'm a living example of that and it is the same thing with God's Word you get fat you get theological theologically bloated you become a theological baby who's just not grown but just you know amassing truth we need exercise and fellowship is that exercise. Fellowship gives way to uh, ministry opportunities. It gives way to missional opportunities. It gives way to care and to really show uh, the love of Jesus between us. So I know you agree with me, but the question is, what are you going to do about it? What am I going to do about it? And you can start with the group, with the people right in front of you. You can start with the few people who are there with you. The Lord bless you. I may take these truths and let it sink deep into your hearts and work through uh, the filters work through the walls, work through the hurdles that we have uh, in our own heart and mind until the truth finds its place uh, in the obedient heart.